So uh, today we are in Hebrews, the third chapter, and we're going to see uh, once again how much of this we'll be able to get. Always my endeavor to try to do one chapter a session, uh, but this is one of those chapters where I'm not sure whether we'll get through it, but we'll, we'll give it a, a good try. Um, keeping in mind, once again, book of Hebrews, what are we looking at? We're looking at a book that is not signed. A lot of evidence and a lot of people believe that more than likely this book was written by the Apostle Paul. And if you remember when we went through Acts, how Paul kept talking about how he wanted to, uh, uh, to get to, uh, to Rome and, and how he wanted to talk to his people and he wanted to deliver unto, he wanted to be the Apostle to the Hebrew people. But as it turned out that God had called Paul to be the Apostle to who? To the Gentiles. Um, and Every time when Paul went into a city and he began to talk to his, uh, his brethren, his Hebrew brethren, more than likely what happened? A battle. <laughs> a, 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 a little riot. So Paul's name had already been, been um, put up as though when, when Paul comes to talk, he's always talking about how we're going to have to put aside the Jewish, or, or I should say the Mosaic law of righteousness and take on Christ who fulfilled the law. All right? And so that became a, 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 a point of strife and of argument. So what we see here in this book, this is what this book is actually developing, is what it's trying to explain, what it's trying to show. Moses' law was good because you need the law to prove to you that you are who God says you are. And the Bible says that we are all uh, born in what? Sin. Shaped in what? Yeah, in but how do you know that? So then what God does is he says, well, here's the law. If you think you're wonderful, you think you're great, here's the law. Live by it. And what happens when we try to live by the law? We can't do it. And so therefore you get frustration, you get disappointment, you get delusion because you try to live this so-called perfect life and try to be obedient to what God has laid out in these commandments and in all of these regulations. And God says, you're going to break it. And if you break one, you're guilty of what? All. all. So then... How then do we get the salvation that is promised or says if you can do this, you can, you can actually so-called earn your way to God. But then Jesus comes. And Jesus fulfills all of the law. And he not only fulfills the law, but he also fulfills all of the what? Prophets. And he becomes our perfect righteousness. And then he says, I will give my righteousness, what? To you. To you. And that's the gift. The wages of sin? Is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. And it's given to you. You don't earn it. It's a gift. It's given to you. So the, the writer of Hebrews, as he started off in that first and that second chapter, in the first chapter he talked about how in many ways and in many times God has spoken to, to us through his prophets and through, uh, uh, and through the law. But he said in these latter days he's spoken to us by his what? His son. Then in... in uh, he also tried to explain how, and God also used the various agencies of the spiritual realm, which were the what? The angels. He used angels. And so oftentimes we'll go into the Old Testament and we'll see uh, an angelic uh, uh, communication between uh, uh, Abraham and the two angels that were left, uh, that they went to go um, destroy which city? Sodom and Gomorrah. And so we'll see that. But then the writer of Hebrew, who I believe is Paul, is saying, but there is even a better person and a better situation than, than the angel's message. And that better person and that better situation is who? Jesus. Jesus. So he's going to continue on in that, in that, uh, in that, uh, that argument that he's trying to bring forth. And remember, who is he writing to? The Jewish people. He's writing to the Hebrews. He's writing to the Jewish people. And so what are they entrenched in? They are entrenched they in what? The they are entrenched in a mosaic law. law. And I, I am doing the law. I'm going to keep the Sabbath. I'm going to do the festivals. I'm going to do that. And that's what they, because they know that was given to them by who? By God. And it's true. Mm -hmm. God did give it to them. And it is a, a good principle. But what God says, you cannot keep it. So therefore, you're going to have to come to God, not by works, but by what? Faith. By faith. And so therefore, the faith that we have is what saves us. And our faith has to reside in who? Good morning. Our faith has to reside in who? Jesus Christ. All right. So let's take a, a, a quick listen. We're going to go read the entire 
third chapter of Hebrews, and then we'll see how much of it we get to go through. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 3. Chapter 3. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house, as a servant, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, albeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. All right, and you see how that third chapter ends. They could not enter in, what? Because of unbelief. That's a very powerful statement. And uh, we're going to elaborate on that uh, uh, just a bit. Um, as we go through this, this third chapter, because that's the key. When you try to hold on to any other type of philosophy of eternal life, um, you're going to fail. It's, it's what the Bible calls the mystery of iniquity. Iniquity is always trying to say, I'm going to find another way to get what God promised us, but by not using God. Science is trying to do that now. We're going, to, we're going to find a way that we can get to eternal life. We're going to help people to live eternally. But we're not going to do it by trusting in Jesus. God says, I've already given you the ways of eternal life. But they're trying to find out how to eradicate sin, how to cure cancer, which they probably already figured out, but just don't want to share with us because there's no money in the cure. But we won't go down that road. Amen. Um, but uh, there's so many different things that, that, that man is trying to achieve that has already been promised to us by God. But the problem is that man wants it on his terms. And God says, no, you have to take it on my terms. Now, what does that mean by his terms? This is what this chapter is going to bring out. This chapter is going to be talking a lot about the children of Israel, that nation that came out of Egypt. You remember the story, or you've seen the movies, you know, the Ten Commandments, or whatever, <coughs> so you read the book, uh, and you saw how that after uh, 400 years of servitude, in Israel, I mean, in uh, Egypt, mm -hmm. that God brought that nation out. And they came out, and they had to, to, you know, remember the ten plagues of Egypt mm -hmm. and all of that? And then they came to the Red Sea, and they crossed over the Red Sea, or what, on dry land, and they entered into this, uh, what they call the wilderness, on their way to what kind of land? A land that flows with what? Mm -hmm. Milk and honey. So it's interesting that when God brings them out of Egypt, which is a representation of sin, he doesn't bring them right to the land of milk and honey. He brings them out of Egypt and then brings them into a wilderness. But then in the land of the wilderness is where he tells them, before I bring you into this land of milk and honey, I need you to, to absolutely believe me. I will bring you through this. And so... He says, and we're going to go into the land. But when you go into the land, it's not going to just be you're going to walk in there and it's going to be wonderful. When you go in there, there are already people there. 
There are people that have that, that are, are entrenched in the land, and you're going to have to do battle with them. The Bible says that the warfare, the 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 the, uh, the, uh, the the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, carnal which, is, which means what? Natural. But they are what? Spiritual. Well, that's what they had to keep in mind. Back then, they did have to fight a, what, a physical war, but their, their the victory was not going to come based on their physical what? ability. God said, I'm going to give you the land. I'm going to give you the ability to overcome. I'm going to be the one that's going to help you win. Well, they did what? They they kind of doubted a little bit, and they said, we're going to go send 12 spies out to go check out the land. And y'all remember the story. So the spies went out, they checked out the land, and they came back, and they said, this land is just like what God said. It is. It's full with milk and honey. They brought back grape clusters that took two men to carry it on the pole. That's how big the grapes were. The grapes were like grapefruit-sized grapes. I ain't never seen no grapes like that. Probably tastes good. <laughs> But they said the land is just like, it's like, it's just fertile, it's good and everything. But we can't go because there are giants in the land. And if we, we won't spend the time to go into why the giants are in the land, but that relates back to Genesis 6. But there are giants in the land, and these giants are of the son of Achan and, and all these different uh, things. They're all related to that, to that same uh, family that even Goliath came from. And remember, this is a, a little note to when did, how did the giants initially hit the earth? Back in Genesis 6, it says when the, when the sons of God saw the daughters of man and they came down unto them and then they had children, which men of, around, uh, men of renown, which were giants. And it says they were in the land then and the Bible says in and after that. So here's another situation where these giants were now in the land. And they're in the land where God says, I'm going to give to you. But you look at these individuals and you go, I can't go in there and defeat them. But God says, but that's the problem. You keep thinking it has to be you. I'm going to give you the victory. And if you don't trust me, you won't win. But if you do trust me, you will win. And that is the struggle that we even have today. We have so much even today about uh, how we don't trust the Lord. So that's the kind of, that's the framework in which uh, Paul, or I should say the writer of this uh, uh, of Hebrews in this chapter is painting. So let's take a look. With that being as a, as a background, let's take a look. Verse 1. It says, Wherefore, holy brethren, all right, and so uh, here's a little a hint, um, you know, that, that uh, Paul is talking, this individual that is talking to these Hebrews probably was of Hebrew descent. He's talking to them from the standpoint of being holy, I mean, of being brethren. Uh, but that's one of those things when people get in and they try to identify whether Paul was the writer of Hebrews or not. But I just throw that in there. It's really, to me, it's not a really a big deal. Uh, I believe Paul wrote it, but wh whoever wrote it uh, knew a whole lot about what uh, it took uh, to make that jump from trusting in Moses to trusting in Jesus. But he says, wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. What is the heavenly calling? For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. All right. If any man come unto me, I will in no wise, what? Cast him out. Partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. All right. Now, um, we talked about the, the aspect of being an apostle, right? Mm -hmm. um, an apostle is an important individual. The apostle speaks with authority. All right. Uh, when Paul was writing to... Um, the Colossian church and to uh, uh, and to Corinthians and to Rome, he always said, Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what he's saying is, I'm not speaking my own words. I'm speaking the words of God. God. That's what an apostle means. A parent can make their child an apostle. A parent has child A and child B. A parent tells child B, go tell child A, I said, clean your room, and take out the garbage. Now, child B is now an apostle of that parent. That child is speaking with the authority of who? Of that parent. And child A better pay attention to what child B just said because child B is not speaking on their own what authority. Child B is speaking on the authority of the what? Of the parent. So that's what an apostle is when they speak directly on the authority of God. And that's why we know that this word, which was written by 
uh, 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 the disciples and the apostles of God is the word of God because it's told to us. And that's why we're going to be held responsible because God told person A, you go tell all these other people I said this. And we can look at it and go, I don't believe it. Now, child A could look at child B and say, I ain't taking the garbage out. I don't believe it. Now what's going to happen? Mm. Now the real authority is going to come. And when the real thought is coming, he's coming with a little bit of what? Wrath. Guess what's going to happen? When God does come, guess how he's coming? He's coming with, God, with, with, with wrath. Mm -hmm. See, when Jesus came the first time, he came meek, lowly, sitting on the donkey. And they beat him, and they, 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 they thorns on his head, and spit in his face, and pulled his beard. Let me tell you something. When Jesus comes the second time, ain't nobody spitting in his face. <laughs> it ain't happening. It ain't going to be that kind of thing. That kind of show. He's coming in with his authority. I told, I sent my child, my, my people to tell you this. And you ignored it. You just totally disregarded what I said. And you knew it. And here's the, 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 the beautiful part. In your heart, you knew it was right. Mm -hmm. And see, that's the, that's, that's the part where God is going to be dealing with. It ain't so much what you say and how you act. It's, he's going to get rid of all the fluff. Because the Bible said a liar won't even what? Carry in his sight. Lie. Let's get right to the truth. You knew it in your spirit, in your innermost being. Because you still wanted to do what you wanted to do, that's why you're going to be held responsible. And that's an important aspect of it. Because, see, uh, God is dealing with real aspects, truth. Not all the fluff that people throw up or all the different kind of you know masks and disguises that folks throw out. God ain't dealing with all that stuff. He's dealing with 100% truth. And so when it says here, um, uh, we're for holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest. So he's the apostle. Here's Jesus Christ coming in the form of who? Mm -hmm. Of a man. Mm -hmm. uh, as we saw in the last chapter, how it said that he made man a little lower than the angels, but then crowned him with glory and with honor. So he's coming as an apostle, as a man coming to speak for God, his father. And he says, he goes, uh, if you've seen me, you've seen the what? The oh. father. Because I'm speaking on his behalf perfectly. And high priest. The high priest was the one that would go and offer up the sacrifice, the sacrifice for the sins of the what? Of the people. people. So he came and he said, I'm going to offer up the sacrifice. But then again, who was the sacrifice? He was. So he's an apostle. He's our high priest, but he also was the one that was sacrificed. He is the sacrificial lamb. Uh, the high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. So in other words, what this writer is saying, you better listen to Jesus. What he's telling you, you better, better pay attention to. <coughs> All right? So look at verse, verse 2. Who was faithful to him that appointed him? So Jesus Christ was what? He was 100% faithful. There is nothing that Jesus did not fulfill that he was supposed to fulfill. He fulfilled everything accordingly. All right? Because what? He was faithful uh, to him that appointed him. As also Moses was faithful in all his house. Now, what is he saying? Just like how Moses, who was the one that delivered the first uh, 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 testament or, the, or the, the original commandments to the nation of Israel and the nation of Israel was the people that God chose to bring the laws of God and the outline or the framework in which Christ was going to come and fulfill and purchase our salvation that responsibility to deliver that message was given to who? Moses and Moses was faithful in bringing it up alright all right, so, uh, and, and it says in verse 3, For this man was counted worthy of more glory than who? Moses. Okay. Which man we're talking about? The man, Jesus, Jesus Christ. He's counted more worthy than Moses. Inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. The architect, the builder, the carpenter, is more valuable than the house because the architect can always do what? Build. He can always build another house. Yeah. I, I can put, I, I can build a house, 
But the house can't get built without my what? Imagination, without my thought process, without my skill. All right. You ever try to do something that you're not good at and you just try to do it anyway? Mm -hmm. right. yeah, it's just <laughs> you be like, you know, I need to call somebody. <laughs> you know, when I first bought my house, you know, it started, I got that, I had a leak in my, in my living room. I'm like, well, you know, it's just a little hole. I can go in there and plug it up. I know what I'm doing, get the right tar. They went up there. Next thing I know, they had the big storm. I had four or five pots in the banana. I like this, don't make no sense now. And then I said, well, let me call a person. And when I called the person, he said he couldn't come because it was, you know, was going to have a big rainstorm. So, I mean, I had pots. I, I felt so bad. I said, I should have called. Because I went up there like two or three times trying to fix it. Each time I went up there, it got worse. <laughs> so then I realized I need to call somebody that what? That knows what they're doing. There's, there's an aspect to water. You have to know water, which I don't. You have to know why water seeks a level and what it tries to get through. and all. I mean, there's a, there's a skill to it. That's right. And if you don't know the skill, you think that you're patching one thing and you're actually making it what? Worse. So I had to find somebody that knew what they were doing. And, and okay, now, now, and they came in there one time, you know, they said, okay, well, you got this problem, got this problem, you know, I paid the money, he fixed it, and it was done. But it's important to know what you're doing. And so um, uh, Jesus Christ uh, is our architect. He is our builder. He is the one that built our house. He is the one that gives us the proper information. You know uh, I should say, he knows what we should know, but we don't. So therefore, he says, trust me, do this. I know you don't understand what I'm, you know, you don't have the knowledge I have, but if you have confidence in me, you know, let me show you what you need to do. And if you do it, you'll be fine. And Jesus says, if you believe in God, believe also what? In me. In me. And that's what he said. If you come, he, he that comes unto me, I will know why is what? Cast you out. All right. Uh, if you call on the Lord Jesus, He will hear you. He will answer you, and that's the simplest aspect of it. But it's so difficult because people try to make it more complex mm -hmm. than what it is. It is the most simplest act of trust and faith that there is. Now, once you get saved and you understand Jesus, then the work of of uh, of, of obedience and of, uh, of growth and of maturity. Yeah, that takes time, it takes development, it takes effort, it takes struggle, all of that. But it has nothing to do with salvation. Salvation is a, another part. It's like once you're born, you are a what? Human. human. You don't have to keep working to become a what? Human. human. You are human once you're born. But then you do got to learn to walk and crawl and, 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 you know, do all the different things, read, write, and, you know, all that stuff that humans learn. But it doesn't make you, well, you know what, I, I think I'm a lot more human now than I, no, you, you, you are still human. All right? And it's the same thing when you're saved. When you're saved, you're saved. But then you develop, you get better, you, you, you recognize things. All right? When you were, when you eight, nine, you know, 10 years old, or even a teenager, you can be easily manipulated. They call it what, child psychology. You can easily try to manipulate it. But then as you get older, you'll be like, you know, no, you can't do that to me. Same thing with Christians. As you grow up in the Lord, you know, you can get into the Bible and you want to, and people will say things to you and it sounds like what? Spiritual stuff. Mm -hmm. But it ain't. It's really just trickery because they want your money or they want this or whatever. The Bible says it's what? A wolf in sheep clothing. All right. So a wolf is not going to put in sheep clothing so you could think he's a wolf. Why does a wolf put on sheep clothing? So you he will is. think he's a what? A sheep. A sheep. But what's his aim? Devouring you. I, I want you to become my meal. I want, it, I want you to become my substance. I want you to fulfill me. And that's a, that's a problem that uh, unfortunately we have. But that takes that what? That growth, that maturity, that development. And God says, I will give you all of that. I will help you to develop that. But you got to trust me. And Jesus says, lo, I come in the volume of a what? Of a book. Here it is right here. Here's the oldest man. And that's why it's important that we go through it and why we don't do it, I don't know, but we need to go through it every line, every letter, every word, because there's nothing in here that's wasted. There is, there, there is nothing in this Bible that you can look at and say, ah, we don't need that, take it out. Everything in here we need. Everything in here is, is for our spiritual development. And therefore, unfortunately, what we normally have been doing lately uh, in the last, you know, 
a couple of decades and, and centuries, you can almost say, is we, we piecemeal. I'm going to take a little bit here, take a little bit here, take a little bit here. Take only what I want. I, I don't want that. I want that. It's like a kid. I don't want no broccoli. I don't want no, no vegetables. I don't, all I want is meat and cookies. <laughs> and, I mean, you'll be, a, you, 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 hmm? <laughs> and potato chips. <laughs> I tried to leave that one off this time. But, uh, you know, you, you, you'll survive for a while, but you'll never be what? Healthy. But if you want to be healthy, you got to eat the whole, and the Bible tells us, you got to eat the whole, the whole loaf. Loaf. everything. So this is what um, Jesus is saying, I am greater. I am the developer. I am the architect. I am the builder of the house. Therefore, I have more honor than the house. Okay? So he says, uh, in verse 5, it says, Mo, Mo, uh, it says, and Moses, did I read all of verse 5? Uh, yes, but the, but he that buildeth all things is God. I didn't finish that last part. Uh, it says, and every house is built by some man. This is verse 4. But he that built all things is who? God. God. All right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He built everything. All right? And that's important to keep in mind. Verse, verse 5. And Moses ver uh, verily was faithful in all his house as a what? Servant. servant. Keep that in mind. All right. He was faithful as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken afterwards. All right. So Moses was faithful and as a servant bringing forth the things that needed to be spoken uh, afterwards. Look at verse 6. But Christ as a what? Son. See, there's a difference between the son versus the what? The servant. All right. Jesus Christ comes as the son. And he is the son of who? God. The son of God. All right. And we talked about that before. When, when, uh, when Mr. and Mrs. Zebra have a son, what is the son? A zebra. When Mr. and Mrs. Kangaroo have a son or a daughter, what is the kangaroo? It's a kangaroo. When God has a begotten son, what is the son? A begotten son. God. It's God. It's God. That's why he is the only begotten God. of the Father. That's key. See, we are called sons or sometimes children of God, which is which is fine. But we are we, we are grafted in. We are part of the uh, uh, the, the, the bringing of the gathering of children unto him. All right? But Jesus Christ is the only begotten of the Father. That's why when people try to argue that Jesus is not God, it's like, no. That's like saying Mr. and Mrs. Kangaroo had a kangaroo, had, 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 a, had a son, and it was an ant. No, it's not less than what it is. It is what it is. All right? And so, it's important to recognize. So, uh, so it says in 6, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are, are we? So in other words, we're part of what? His house. Yeah. If we hold fast to, the, to uh, fast the confidence and the rejoicing of hope firm until the end. All right. What is our hope in? Our hope is in Jesus. It's in God. It's in Jesus. It's in Christ. Exactly. All right. Look at verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Spirit saith, today, if ye will hear my, hear, hear his voice, do what? Harden not your heart. And then he's going back to what we talked about earlier, um, the wilderness time. He goes, as, now he's giving an example, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. All right, that's what we when we try to paint that that little picture there. So before we get got here, all right. So we're back now in the wilderness, right? Children of Israel, they're there in the wilderness. Well, it says here that they hardened their heart. They they would they wouldn't listen to God. God, you said you were going to give us this land, but it looks too difficult. And that is our struggle today. I, we all suffer from this. God will tell you, I need you to do something. 
God, it, it's, it's too difficult. It does, it, I, I don't know if I can do that. Now, I know that we all have been in situations where we recognize, I, I should have trust God here. I should have trust him a little bit more here. I should have believed him. Because we'll, or a lot of times we, got it, we already got it in our mind how we want it to pan out. And Israel had it in their mind how they wanted it to pan out. We're coming from, from Pharaoh's house, and we're going right to land of milk and honey, man. We're going to have, you know, you know honey wafers and, 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 and crackers and milkshakes. It's going to be great. No, there was a, a step in between because what he's going to do is he's going to weed out certain individuals that really are not there and it turns out there was quite a few, <laughs> almost all, mm -hmm. that were not there for the reality of what God said. You believe me, but you don't. You believe that I'm God. You believe that I will bring you from Egypt. I can bring you to the Red Sea. You trust me enough to step in that Red Sea. Mm -hmm. But you don't trust me enough now that you don't have the enemy chasing you and everything seems to be okay. You don't trust me enough to just give you daily provisions, day by day. So therefore, you know, we got to, Piled up in the bank. That's what they wanted. I want it piled up. And God says, and they were complaining, we don't got no food. We don't got no water. Mm -hmm. I'm, and then when God says, all right, I'm going to give you food, I'm going to give you what? Manna. Yeah. And then when they got the manna, they complain every day. We get manna. I got manna crackers and manna chips and manna hot dogs and manna, you know, everything was manna, 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 manna. And they complained about the manna. We don't have no what? No meat. Mm -hmm. And then God says, I'm going to send you quail. Mm -hmm. And they had the quail, but then they complained about the quail. Oh, I got his quail. So the philosophy that God was proving was that you don't really believe in me. You're here and trusting that I'm just going to give you what you want. You just, you, your, your philosophy is I'm praising you so you can bless me. Mm -hmm. Not that I just want to know you and the, and, and the suffering. Of, of your fellowship, or I want to know who you are as God, or just, just to know God, or to trust God. Mm -hmm. It's all about, I want to know you so you can bless me. That's now, that's the philosophy that is permeating today. And that's what you have to watch out for. That's why I say you got to be careful sometimes with your list. Because the reality is, do you really want to know God, or do you want to be blessed? Well, you say, well, I want both. Wait a minute. No. Knowing God makes you automatically what? Blessed. You can't get any more blessed than being a friend of God. But people say, no, I want houses and lands and cars and money and health and all that kind of... Well, God says, you, you will get all of that. Well, how you say I'm going to get all that because I don't got it now. I, ain't, I can't, I'm barely paying my bills. But the, is God a man that he can what? Lie? And if you die broke, what does that mean? That means that God's blessing for you was for what? The eternal realm which is what he has promised us. But when we put all of our focus on, I need it now. I want it today, and I want a lot of it. And I want it every day. What spirit are we working in? Mm. What did Lucifer say? I'm going to rise. Indeed. I'm going to set my throne upon over the Most High. So he wanted, Lucifer was a consumer. He wanted stuff to come into, I want this, I want this. But God wants us to be a giver. He wants us to help others. He wants us to recognize that, that uh, God will use us to be a blessing. But in using you to be a blessing, guess what happens? He's blessing you. You get blessed. And there is where your blessing comes in. So when people say, well, I'm going to, you know, we used to have this phrase, um, you know, back in the days when uh, we just, it was a phrase. <laughs> people would say, when the praises go up, Blessings come, Blessings come down. Mm -hmm. all right. And now, well, is that, I mean, this is not what it's all about. The Bible is trying to help us to understand you're in a battle. You're in a war. You're in a struggle. There are demon, demonic and, and, and evil spiritual forces that are coming against you. Now, the trick of the enemy is to get us to be ignorant of those things. If you can be ignorant of the fact that the devil's trying to set little traps for you, guess what you're going to do? You're going to run into the traps. See, that's like driving down, dri driving down the spring brook after the, they plowed the spring brook four or five times because of snow and just saying, I don't believe in potholes. Guess what's going to happen? You're going to blow out a tire. 
Because you got to have your, because you got to, you got to know. I'm not ignorant of how it works. When snow comes, I have enough experience as a driver, and I've seen how certain roads are, that when I go after these storms come, and they do this plowing, that normally there are what? Potholes. That comes from what? Not being ignorant of it. So I have to then drive with the awareness that there are what? Does that mean you will never hit a pothole? No. No. But you will keep a what? Oh, an eye. Same thing from the spiritual standpoint. I know that the realm that we're living in now is not only just a natural realm, but it's also a what? A spiritual realm. And I recognize the Bible says that we are not ignorant of the devil's devices. So anything that I try to do for God, I know the devil's going to try to set a what? A barrier. A trap. A snag. To get me what? Discouraged and to blow a tire spiritually. So I can't do what God has promised or, if, you know. And so, therefore, I have to be what? Aware. I have to have my eyes open. I have to be concerned. But if you're not thinking spiritually, if you're only thinking about, I just want blessings and I just want this. I want natural stuff. I want my car. I want my house. I want my bank account. You know, I want all this going on. And if that's all you're thinking about, you're not tuning in to the spiritual battle. Which is what the real battle is. We fight not against yes. flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and, and, and spirits and evil wicked, wickedness in high places. Therein is our real struggle. But off the time, we try to fight, you know, we fight each other. We got the Democrats, Republicans, left wing, right wing, and all that. And they're just two wings of the same dirty bird, you know. But the, the, it's, it's a reality that the, the devil tries to keep us occupied with the things that don't really matter. This is the real fight. It's a spiritual battle. But it's not always that glamorous or that, you know, popular or that whatever, because I'm going off on a tangent. I'm going off on a, down another road now. <laughs> Let me pull this back in and get back here. But, but I, 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 do you get my point? Yeah. I think you get my point, right? Mm -hmm. All right. I, I said enough on that because I can go on and on. I, I, I'll get. So um, these children are in the wilderness and they are just, they, they are not. Their mindset is not right. All right, and I said enough on that. Let's look at verse 9. When your fathers tempted me, provoked me, and saw my works 40 years. So look what the, the Lord is saying. He goes, your fathers, talking about those people that were in Israel. They tempted me, and they provoked me, because they saw my works. They saw what I can do. How are you going to say that I can't bring you into the land of milk and honey when you were in Egypt and you saw those plagues? You were at the Red Sea, and you saw the east wind come and just open up the Red Sea. And you walked on not muddy, soggy ground. It said they walked on what? Dry, Dry ground. You saw this, but yet you still won't trust God? All right. He said, you provoked me. Verse 10, wherefore I was grieved with that what? Generation. That whole generation. What does that mean? That means that you could have a generation of philosophy that is wrong, that everybody believes in. Because all died except for who? Two. Why? Because that whole generation had a philosophy, had an ideology that was incorrect. We have a lot of philosophies and ideologies coming in today that are incorrect. You don't need to get married to have sex. Well, how much of that is being permeated through all of our popular media. Look at the movies. Look at the TV shows. Look at the magazines. Look at all. And it's telling our young folks, that's ancient and an archaic belief. You don't need to do that. Don't believe in that. The whole generation is growing up. What? Believe in that. Right? And, and I could go on and on. I mean, I could, I could go on another tangent right now, but I, I'm going to try not to. I can go on another one about what our generation today, you young folks, are dealing with that y'all going to have to rebuke, uh, rebuke, but you're going to have to do it with the word of God. You're going to have to have the, the scriptural knowledge to know it's not right. There are some issues out here that our generation has accepted as fine, but what's going to happen? They're going to die in the wilderness. You're going to die in that philosophy. Um, and um, we care for our, our, our young folks and we want y'all to know the truth. Because uh, the truth is what, what actually sets you free. 
Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always error. You're always making mistakes. All right. We're living ever since um, uh, uh, the, the generation of uh, Darwinism comes up. That's a philosophy. And so they believe that, well, we know what we have another way of explaining how human beings got here other than God created. So we don't have to believe that in the beginning God created. Heaven. We have another philosophy. Error. You do always error. This generation is, once again, error. In their hearts, the error in their hearts, and they have not known what? My ways. You don't know my ways. And if you don't know the ways of God, guess what you're in? You're in error. You are, you are walking in ignorance if you don't know the ways of God. All right? Verse 11. So I swear... In my wrath. Oh, you don't want that. Because see, when God says, I swear in my wrath, that means whatever wrath is coming, you're going to get it. There is no, <laughs> there is nothing to save you. Okay. I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Now, didn't say they weren't saved. It says they're not going to do what? Enter. You're not going in. You're still my what? People. People. But you're not going. Because they said, we can't go in. Because when the, ten, when, the, when the 12 spies came back, the 12 spies said, yes, the land is just like God said it was, but it's full of giants. And 10 of the spies said, we can't go in there because we can't win. Caleb and Joshua said, yes, we can. We can go in there. We can win. We can just got to trust God. God's going to give us a victory. Because, see, they didn't have their focus on what they could do. They had their focus on what? What, what God, God was going to do. All right. But then uh, they didn't believe Caleb and Joshua. They only believed, they believed the ten spies. And so they just said they, they're not going to go in. And it's a big, long story because afterwards God came. And then the people said, okay, we're sorry. We'll, we'll, we'll go in and we'll fight. And God said, don't go in now, because now I'm not with you. Don't go in and fight now. Now you will get destroyed. But they went in anyway, once again, disobeying, and they got, you know, pushed back. And it's a, it's a good story. Uh, and when we get to the Old Testament, God willing, we'll go through that and point all that stuff out. All right. So, um, um, verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart. Of what? Unbelief. Right. Won't believe God. You don't want that unbelief in you. And departing from the living God. Because once you have unbelief, you separate yourself from the things that God is trying to do. See, if you don't believe God can save you, guess what? You won't get saved. Won't get saved. It just won't happen. It's going to be a sad day. Because it's the simplest thing. And our responsibility is for us to know, and then those that are, we are parents, it is our responsibility to make sure our children know. Because they got to be the ones that tell, tell what? Their children. All right? And so, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart. Look what he, he equates evil heart to the unbelief. Evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Verse 13. But exalt one another. How often? Daily. Daily. That's our responsibility. Exalt one another. So parents should talk to the child. Husband talk to the wife. Wife talk, wife talk to the husband. Friend talk to the friend. Neighbor talk to the neighbor. Acquaintance will talk to acquaintance. So we should be, this should be something that we focus on what? Daily. Daily. It should be part of what you do. All right? While it is called today, lest any of you by the, the hardening through uh, deceitfulness of sin, lest any of you become hard in your heart through the deceitfulness of what? Sin. What is deceitfulness of sin? What does that mean? It's a simple aspect when you think about it because, see, that's what the devil tries to do. The Bible says that the devil is the accuser of the what? Of the brethren. He accuses you. And so uh, 
the, the world tries to get you to live in sin. But if the world can't get you to live in sin, because the world's trying to change this whole generation's thinking. But if the, if the world can't change your thinking, then the devil will come in and work in your imperfection. Because you're not perfect. And so when you make a mistake, the devil tries to do what? Accuse. He accuses him. It makes him, look at how bad you are. Look at that. And then you know what you got to do? The Bible says agree with your adversary quickly. He goes, That's right, I am. I am bad. The Bible says I'm bad. The Bible says that I'm born in sin and what? Shaped in iniquity. It says, my Bible says that my best righteousness is what? But filthy rags. But thanks be unto God, Jesus Christ. He's my Savior. You see that? And that's what you got to work on. That's what, you, yeah, yeah, you got issues. We all got issues. And we all strive to do better. We're not trying to just, uh, uh, like, as it says in Romans, we don't want to sin that what? Grace may abound. No, no, no. God forbid, the Bible says. Right. But you try to do better. But even in, the, in you're trying to do better, you're always going to come up a little short. You're going to make a mistake here or there. Sometimes you lose your temper or whatever. But that's okay. When the devil tries to come into you and try to provoke you and say, look at you. Now, you, you think you are a child of God. Look at how you lost your temper. Look at how you got to. Yep, that's right, that happens. But thank God for the grace of God. Grace is what? Unmerited? Faith. Favor. God gives me good things when I don't even deserve them. Mm. And what is mercy? God doesn't punish me when I deserve to be punished. His grace and his mercy. All right? And so, therefore, it's important that we don't allow ourselves to get uh, hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Because it will try to confuse you and deceive you. All right, remember, if you're gods, you're gods. 14. For we are made partakers of who? Christ. Of Christ. What are we partaking in? His righteousness. righteousness. His eternity. All right, his fellowship. We're grafted into the family of God. All right? We are made partakers of Christ. If we hold uh, the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the what? Until the end. Yeah. Right? That's an important aspect that we got to hold on. All right? Now the reality of it is that once you hold on to God, guess what God is doing? Holding on to you. He's holding on to you. And, and once God has you in his hand, who's yeah. going to take you out? No devil Nobody can take you out of God's hand. Nobody. All right? So if you, if you, if you start, God will finish. But the reality of it is that the Bible even tells us that, that you can't even start on your own because all we, we are drawn to God by the what? By the Spirit. And I, I can go into another tangent on that, but I'm, I'm going to move along here. 15. While, uh, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your what? Oh. Second time this guy just said yeah, this. Exactly, yeah. right. What does that mean? I need you to pay attention to this. You don't harden your heart. Don't just say, I don't believe what God's saying. It's archaic or it's old-fashioned or it don't make no sense. You better pay attention to this because God will work with you. But if you turn your back on God, that is not going to be a good thing. All right? It is not going to be a good thing, especially those that know. See, those that don't know will be beaten with few stripes. But if you do know, to him that knows to do better, you'll be beaten with what? Many. Many stripes. All right? And, um, I mean, and, and then let me just t take a pause here. Let me go on a small tangent here. Let me go back to the, to the parent-child relationship. Um, I know we're living in a day-to-day -day where today tell you that, you know, we should not uh, discipline our kids in certain ways. But when a child does something to you, uh, or to another child, uh, disrespectful or, or, or hateful, uh, it is your job as a parent to do what? To chastise. To chastise, to discipline. You got to make sure that that child doesn't recognize that that is proper behavior. You can't do that. You can't speak to me that way. Matter of fact, you can't speak to any adult. Matter of fact, you don't speak to any person like that. That's not the kind of language or the type of attitude we accept. So I'm going to do what? I have to tell you. You need to stop that. That's my responsibility as a parent. Now, if I see my child just, and I look at it, well, you know, kids will be kids. <laughs> no, I have just neglected my responsibility. All right? I got to make sure that I give to my children, and to, you know, to my, because the Bible says that if you're going to 
work in the house of God, you must first be able to work in what? In your own house. So you got to give that instructions and that development and all that. All right? But it's, imp it's, it's, it's important that you, that you allow that, uh, that, that sense of it's my responsibility to give the information. It's my responsibility. I don't just allow you to hear what I say and walk all about your business like, you ain't, like I ain't said nothing. If I say, pick up that cup and put it in the sink. Don't just leave it there. I'll pick it up when I get good and ready to. That ain't happening. No, it's my responsibility to make sure that you understand that you got to do these things as you're told. And then when you get your own house, if you want to leave your own cup, then you do it. If I tell you to make up your bed or do all that, but then what happens? As the child gets older, they recognize it. Well, you weren't just trying to be mean. You're trying to show me how to do what? How to live. How to do things. How to be responsible. How to be courteous. How to be f functional in society. And you begin to recognize it. It wasn't you just trying to be the boss. It's you trying to do what? Trying to help me. You actually were trying to what? Help me. And the child eventually will learn to appreciate that about the what? About the parent. Those of us that are grown, we recognize, okay, I see what my parent was trying to do. But the discipline must what? Must be there. And it must be consistent. All right. Let me get off of that tangent. 15 again. <laughs> While it is said today, if you, uh, if you will hear my voice, harden not your heart as in the day of provocation. All right. Look at verse 16. For some, when they had hardened, did provoke. Howbeit, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. All right. And what is the out? Not all. That didn't provoke? Two. Two. Only two. That's, that's sad when you think about it. Because even Moses didn't make it in. Mm -mm. All right? But there's an aspect to it because Moses was also the representation of the what? Of the law. And the law can't bring you to rest. And we can go into that for a little bit. But uh, who brought them into the land of milk and honey? Joshua. Mm -hmm. All right? And Joshua is the captain of the army. Who is the captain of our army? Jesus. Jesus. And Joshua and Jesus is a, uh, th th those words are, in the two languages are, are the same. And uh, I won't go into that any further than that. You can study that on your own if you want to. All right, verse 17. Looks like we probably will get through this today. But with uh, whom was he grieved 40 years? Who was God grieved with? Was it not with them that had what? Sinned. Sin. Whose carcasses fell in the what? Wilderness. They, they died in the wilderness. You, they never got a chance to go into the land of milk and honey. They didn't cross the Jordan River. They died in the struggle. They mm -hmm. died in the unfulfilled land. They died in the land where you, 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 did, you never got to eat milk and honey. You got to eat manna. God, gave, God fed you. Mm -hmm. You got water from a what? From a rock. rock. All right? You got quail that fell low. But you never got to the land of what? Milk and honey. You never got to where God... And so many of, of, of us oftentimes, we stay in that land of wilderness. Not ever moving into the land of milk. And the reason why we stay in the land of milk, uh, a wilderness and not the land of milk, is unbelief. I don't believe God. Because I want it my way. The people in the wilderness, they complain about everything. Always complaining don't like this. I don't like this. I don't know why this has got to be like this. How come I don't have this? Why didn't we have this? Complain, complain, murmur, complain, complain, murmur. That's all they did. And guess what happened? Their carcasses died in the wilderness. Because God was saying, if you just would trust me, I'm going to bring you through this. But they refused to trust the Lord because they wanted it their way. Yes, sir. Well, that's what most of our theologians try to tell us today that it's, you know, it's just milk and honey. Just you send me this and God will bless you. You, you know, like the thing you were saying, the blessings go, the praises go up, blessings come down. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're trying to do. And I always tell people that, you know, God is not like that, you know, you thinking that. Your blessing is, is all this house, car, fancy car, fancy house, all this. That's God's blessing. Mm -hmm. That's not God's blessing. God's blessing when you woke up this morning. Mm -hmm. That's a blessing. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. The, the fact that you know Jesus and the, and the pardoning of your sins, you can't get any more blessed than that. And that's the aspect of it. It's the fellowship. All right? It's the fellowship. And that's an important aspect of it. Um, 18. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. All right? Those that did not believe are not going to enter into his rest. And see, and there's an aspect of walking with God where uh, the struggle of, of the lies that permeate our society don't phase you. And that's a rest. It's not that you enter into glory where you're transformed, but you enter into a rest. Where the, the scripture says that you will have uh, the peace that, that, that passes what? All under the state. People can't, I can't understand under all your circumstances why you have that kind of peace. Man, I'm trusting God. I can't understand when you're, you are that sick and you are okay. <laughs> Same answer. <laughs> I'm trusting God. You got but couple days to live, and you just okay with, I'm trusting God. You know, but it's, it's, it's to trust it in God in all aspects. And we'll see that when we get to, to Hebrews 11. Right? How he talked about the faith, and all the, he's going to talk about all the faith of people that were able to overcome. Like, you know, we, you know, we always like to talk about the Hebrew boys. Mm -hmm. They went into the fire, but they came out, and they did it. Daniel, he went into the lion's den, but he came out. But we, we, we neglect to talk about sometimes Isaiah, you know, who was, who was sawed in half. Or we neglect to talk about Paul, who ended up getting his what? His head chopped off. All right? So all of them went through what? Faith. They, they, did, they showed the faith too. Paul was like, when, he, when we studied Paul and, and, uh, and the, uh, Second Timothy, and remember, Paul at that time was not in the house arrest. Paul was in the what? Jail. He was in the dungeon. dungeon. <laughs> Two different arrests that Paul had. People have to keep in mind. So when he talked, when he was in Second Timothy, and he's talking and writing that, and he's talking about how all these people have left me, demons haven't haven't what forsaken me, because it got to the point where Nero was saying, because Nero was blaming the Christians for the the, the, the burning or the setting of fire of the, of the, the city of Rome, and he blamed the Christians, although history says he did it. But anyway. Um, so now they arrested him. It's like, okay, if you believe in this so-called sect of Jesus Christ, uh, whatever this thing is, we're, we're arresting you. And so people that were on the fringes, oh, I believe in Jesus. I believe in him. Okay, if you believe in you, you're going to get arrested like Paul. Uh, you know what? I'm not really sure I believe in it. I, I, that, that ain't my religion. Mm -mm. I don't believe in that. And Paul said, all these people have forsaken me because they don't want to go through what I went through. Demons left me. And he said, why? But having loved this present world. Right? And so it's an important aspect that, yes, the wilderness testing comes a lot of times to see, do you really love God? I'm put, you go into the wilderness to see. And so, and guess who else is in the wilderness? Remember when Jesus was taken out into the wilderness? That's right. Who else was out in the wilderness? The devil. The devil. See, he's there too. And he's saying and talking and whispering in your ear, trying to get you to believe stuff that it is wrong. So you got to be it. But then what did Jesus use? He used the scripture three times mm -hmm. against the devil. The devil even tried to use the scripture himself. Mm -hmm. right? But uh, it's important that we recognize. All right. Final verse. So we see that they could not enter. What? Because of unbelief. They refuse to say, man, I'm trusting in the Lord. It don't matter what your circumstances are. Once you really have it in your heart. And let me tell you something. It's not always easy. When, when, when people get laid off their jobs and different things happen and you're trying to pay your bills and everything, you still got to go. You still should look for a job. You shouldn't. See, this is where people get, get it mixed up. Well, I got laid off my job. Well, why did you get, you know, you know what, what are you doing trying to find? Well, I ain't doing nothing. I'm just trusting God. No, 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 no. See, that ain't right either. 
Because the, when God gives you a, the ability to do, you should do what? You mm -hmm. should do. So you got to go out and you got to, you know, you try to do all that you can do. And then when you have done all that you do, you what? You stand and let God do what he does. It's important that we don't get it confused. We get it mixed up a lot of times thinking that, you know, you got some people say, well, I don't want to trust God for anything. I'm going to do everything myself. That ain't work. And you got other people say, well, I'm going to trust God for everything. I ain't doing nothing myself. Well, you got two, two, two spectrums that are both in error. They're both wrong. So you got the world telling you, don't worry about it. I'm just do it your own way. Do what you can. Do what your own. You, you know, do what you do. Do your thing. But then you got other people that are, still, you know, what I call really, really spiritual deep folk. You know, I'm just trusting God. I ain't doing nothing. I'm just gonna pray and fast and lock myself up in a room and I'm waiting for the manna to drop down with, you know, milk and honey. Well, you gonna get kicked out. You gonna get evicted, and you are gonna be in the street. Because the Bible says if a, a man don't work, he shouldn't what? Eat. He shouldn't eat. So that's why you have to read the whole Bible. Because it, it helps you to bring forth a what? Balance. You need the balance. Because some people take a piece of the Bible. It's like them people down there. And I'm going to say this and then we'll be done. Those snake, those snake handlers. You, you've seen those people on TV? Mm -hmm. they, they, they have a church, but they grab, they, because the Bible says, you shall tread upon serpents. Sure. And so they believe that. We believe God. Did he say we, and if he said we're going to tread upon, uh, tread upon serpents, I'm going to tread upon a serpent. I'm going to grab me a poison snake and, them, and it's, if it bite me, it's not going to kill me. These people are crazy. Mm -hmm. Because that's not what the scripture says. And if you read the whole Bible, what they did, they took one verse mm -hmm. and built a doctrine around one verse. And that verse does not talk about that. It's talking about the spiritual aspect. That no, no matter what the enemy is trying to do, he won't be victorious against you, against what I'm trying to do. You see? The devil won't defeat what God's trying to do. Now, Paul ended up getting his what? His head chopped off. And, and you know the devil's behind it, but God said, well, Paul, you're done. And so Paul, he ended up saying, he goes, I know laid up for me is a crown of righteousness. He says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have you know, fought a, a, a good fight. Therefore, it is laid up for me a crown of what? Righteousness. So Paul knew. My day of departure is at hand. I'm done. And I know that God's going to allow me to go into the hands of the enemy. And when I go into the hands of the enemy, I'm going to be with the Lord. Because the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present, present with the Lord. Man, let me tell you something. It takes faith. It takes real. That's why you have to have your faith in this word. Not in man. Not in no philosophy. Not in some kind of doctrine. But in the word of God. If your faith is in the word of God, you stand. Because that word of God is a true representation of who? Jesus Christ. Lo, I come in the volume of a... The book. Mm -hmm. Once again, we can take the same scenario. You know, when, when you, uh, you, you write a letter and you sign your name, who's speaking? You. Same thing. When God says, here's my information, who's speaking? God is. That's why his word is alive. And it's quick and powerful. Sharper than any what? Two-edged sword. Because it is his word. And his word, his word is not dead. Why? Because God is not dead. His word is always alive and always powerful. Because what? God is alive and powerful. And that's why it's, we ignore this to a shame. We, 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 we look at it as uh, assorted cookies. I take the ones I want. You know, you, you know, I like those kind of cookies. So, you know, you go in there and you got the chocolate chip and you got the coconut and different ones. And you can take the cookies you like. But you can't do that with the word. When it comes with the word, you got to eat what? The whole. Everything. And that's why it's important to go through the entire scripture. Because once you do that, now you've got balance. And the Bible says that I will bring back to, into your remembrance everything, all things which I have what taught you. But if you have not been taught, what's coming back to your memory? Nothing. All right, let me stop because I can go on and on and on. <laughs> Any other comments or questions?